FM Radio for the Agile Community. www.agile.fm. Welcome to another episode of Agile FM. Today I have uh, John Kern with me, who is a one of the authors, a co-author of the Agile Manifesto. He enjoys loud cars, travel, climbing, beer, individual freedom, small governments. That's what his Twitter. Uh, profile says so welcome to the podcast john thank you joe appreciate it yeah we could talk about a lot of things here uh including beer and travel and you do travel quite a bit um but the one thing i want to talk about is the um agile manifesto we are recording this in february 2021 and that is also the 20th anniversary of the agile manifesto so very timely recording here and i want to reflect a little bit on that day that weekend uh, you guys had in uh, utah um, so this is the, how do you feel about this anniversary? Just like curious, uh, it's been 20 years and you know, yeah, I remember the, the 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. That was, uh, kind of shocking. That was already 10 years and 20 certainly seems like it flew by. So it's, it's pretty amazing that the opportunity have had that much of an impact over 20 years on so many millions of people mm -hmm. is truly humbling. And the fact that it's still relevant, still worth talking about, right. I think it's, is, is a fairly amazing feat of happenstance, frankly. Nobody knew this would take off and, and anyone would care about it, even 20 days from, yeah. from the day we, did, or the day we, we uh, left Snowbird. So, yeah. That's so, yeah. So you, I mean, obviously nobody could know what would come out of, of this uh, weekend, right? It could have been just a fun weekend of skiing um, or there's more and there was more. There is after 20 years, we're still talking about it. Every time I talk about the Agile Manifesto and I refer to it uh, to folks I work with uh, professionally, I always say this is a side uh, that is probably the one website in the internet that not a single pixel has changed in 20 years. I think <laughs> that's, a, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's still the same, right? And but there is something about that that it is still the same. So it's still relevant in the same way. We're still talking about very similar topics and coaches, maybe on different levels, but they were still talking about the same topic. So it shows how uh, instrumental this uh, this was. So thank you for that. How do you feel? How do you feel about Agile in 2021 now? Like, I mean, obviously uh, there was a lot of things going on in the in the early days in 2001, 2002. There's a financial crisis and all that kind of stuff that uh, led to us. Now we're in the middle of a pandemic, but uh, so we went through a lot as a society. But from a from a community's perspective, where are we? What how do you feel about Agile as a as a topic in the community in the industry uh, and what companies out there do with it? Well, I think the, while there, you know, I would say part of the problems that maybe anything like this faces is how folks embrace it, how they interpret it, how they practice Agile. And so there is, and it's been this way from pretty much the day we published it. It obviously resonated, obviously struck a chord I feel we got to the gist of the kind of how how humans endeavor to build software. Mm -hmm. But yet there's always going to be, I don't want to say it's the crossing the chasm type thing, but you know, there's still plenty of frustratingly non-agile going on in the name of agile. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that that's just you know, you, you, the sort of the beauty of the Agile Manifesto is its its humility, its its brevity, <clears throat> its ambiguity. Shall I even say? Right. right. It's not. It's not. It's not prescriptive. Yes. And that means you have to think, and that means you have to apply it in context, and that means you have to be curious and humble about your your ways of working and so i think those that get it it's 
a boon, right? Mm -hmm. There are kick-ass agile teams and agile companies and agile and lean companies, right? You can see there's a radical difference of those who get it, practice it, live it, breathe it. <laughs> and then those who treat it more as a prescriptive, you know, they might've latched on to scrum or, or safe or, you know, some very prescriptive and then not moved on from there, you know, okay. and they're just still lo locked into um, a different, I don't want to say draconian, but, it, but a, a different uh, command and control way of right. being agile. Uh, yes. So I think, you know, that's, you, you can't have perfect, uh, you know, perfect interpretation of such a small document. So, you know, I, I, it, it's understandable, but I think that's, you know, that's still going on. And, and I, you know, I hope folks push can push through that mm -hmm. and really get more of the benefit of the agile mindset and not just a handful of prescriptive recipes. Right. Very much like a declaration of independence, right? Also not, you know, there's also room for interpretation and that makes it so, uh, so flexible, right? Yeah. And I, and with all due humility, I, I think it, I, I draw a parallel to you know, a, a unique group of individuals came together thought up some pretty amazing intense words about, you know, the, the declaration of independence about how to, how to govern mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And we were more, you know, of course, just the software side of things, but it, yeah, it's that it, it's getting to the gist of the problem domain, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's, it's this very similar. How do you, in, you know, France, for example, screwed up. <laughs> You know, the, the, their, you know, revolution yeah, right. was not built on the right principles mm -hmm. versus, you know, the, 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 the freedom that the Declaration of Independence right. talked about. So I think Agile is very similar. Mm -hmm. You can misinterpret it and think you're going along that way and still end up being a kind of a command and control, cool. not happy place to work, but you're Agile. Right. That's, that's what, I, what I often see is when people are talking about the Agile Manifesto, but they're not even aware of the 12 principles, right? It's just like the four value statements. And obviously those are very vague and uh, purposely, right? And that leaves room for interpretation either way. And you're ending up with an organization so-called Agile uh, that, is, that is really far away from what, what you might be thinking uh, of Agile, what I would be thinking of Agile, right? Um, are you are you nervous that this is, might get washed away that uh, term over time? I mean, it's been around for twenty years, but with the current trends we're going through, do you feel like at one point people will be like, "All right, this agile, we we don't have a handle on it. There is no clear definition." Are you uh, nervous, or are you feel like there is there will there's light at the end of the tunnel that we're we're getting to the state of what you guys thought of two thousand one? Well, that's a good question. I wouldn't be nervous because it's not my job to, <laughs> to, 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 you know, force people to get it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I treat it as a personal practice because it really does start with you. Mm. It's not, you know, organizations want to have an agile transformation, but it starts with the individual. It starts with the understanding as you said, it's not only the the four tenets, but the the principles and 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 even more because we were humble. Like the, the one of the top words is uncovering. It's not even uncovered, right? We're not. It's not even past tense. You know, we, we didn't act as if we had, you know, God's gift to the answers of of the world for software development. We, but we said we're uncovering because we're learning. I I practice a lot of defense department. Mm -hmm. heavyweight stuff and created in self-defense kind of as a taxpayer right. uh, a lighter weight methodology to work with my my defense department uh, customers you know so even there you know we're con you know, we really left in my mind left it clear that it's still going on mm -hmm. right? that was a certain point in time what we uncovered what we were trying to uh, address in heavyweight processes. And, you know, I think going forward, you can, uh, 
in my mind, those bullets still apply. Mm -hmm. Principles are still valid. And what you do with them, I'm not so much troubled. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. I think this might, you know, this this anniversary might inject because there's people. It's shocking to say there's there's people that didn't hear of anything but agile in the industry now. Mm -hmm. Right? They didn't they didn't experience what what I experienced with mill standard 2167 or heavy waterfall type processes or you know, some of the crazy stuff that was, you know, the, the, the elements that we were trying to combat in terms of heavyweight process. So a lot of people don't even know those existed. Mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it's a Fine. opportunity to maybe reinvigorate some, some of those who might've slipped into learned helplessness, you know, in a large organization, like, yeah. Oh, that's right. There's, there's a there it could be a light at the end of the tunnel let's let's return to some of these basics let's mm -hmm. let's try to try to um get back to what agile was all about in the beginning so i'm yeah. hopeful but yeah like whatever you know i mean it's all right um it was ari von benicom i spoke with here on agile fm um a, a little while ago and uh, he was the one who actually said John was the guy who said that everybody leaves their ego in front of the door before you come in at that weekend. So it was, and that goes back to your statement about being humble, right? There were lots of people, 17 of them, different opinions. What was, uh, why were you there? We know like people that were from, from Scrum, there was DSDM, there was extreme programming. So there was a broad mix of different kind of, uh, streams i would say at that point right of development things right but um just curious yeah, there, to, to the yeah, there, yeah there was the you know the xp contingent um i was there because i i was working with peter code and we were doing feature driven development we had to we built together soft at the time a wonderful uml modeling tool that i remember messing around with bob martin with um so yeah i mean i i co-authored some things, but I was not famous like the others in the room. So I was on the coattails of Peter Code, and Peter said, this sounds like right up your alley, John. Mm -hmm. So I, I attended and yeah. participated heavily because, yeah. because of my Defense Department days and my penchant for being pragmatic and, and lean and Absolutely. trying to deal with the ambiguities of, of software development. I had a lot of opinions. Mm -hmm. And you, you're the one that um, I, I came across your notes from the event, right? So you captured notes and everything. You released those. It's almost like a, it's like a museum's artifact, almost, right? Yeah. Where you have like the uh, your, your personal notes from the from the weekend, and maybe we can hyperlink those on the show page as well uh, for people to see. Um, so that is all great stuff. What are you focusing on these days yourself? I know you do a, quite a bit of traveling, but from a software's perspective. Um, what, what are you focusing on these days? Well, right now I'm working at Adaptivist, you know, adaptivist.com, mm -hmm. who you would think might be a little odd because they are the, probably by any reasonable measure, the biggest, baddest, uh, best Atlassian partner, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in many circles, the Agilistas you know, will shun Jira or something like that. Now, I've been using Jira and Confluence since whenever the hell it came out. And I was mm -hmm. using other tools before that. And I've been pitching for 20 years, people processing tools in that order. And tools are a real third distance. And I've sold tools, but I know where they, they, they live. You know, it's the people first. Right. So, so there was an opportunity there. And, and, I, and one of the gentlemen, one of the reasons why well, I knew somebody who worked there who insisted. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I talked talk, talk to the CEO. So we're setting up <clears throat> more of a, a innovation center and helping other companies learn how to have more of an agile mindset. So we're really hitting the people and culture side of things and process and tools. Mm -hmm. But it's it's the more of the the kind of uh, agile mindset and the workshops and some of the you know, we, we, we combine some elements of motivational orientation and engagement. And we're also working with Heidi Araya, who's 
who has a lot of experience with larger organizations than I do, for example. And so we're really striking out on a, on a pretty fascinating chord because until I met John, you know, some of the things that, that, that we began talking about and, and he helped shed light on about ways that people make their meaning different different like leadership development profiles so i learned why in some cases a technique that i would use worked like gangbusters with a team and, and other times i would talk and i'd be like knock 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 is this thing on Are you, you know do you can you even hear right and he he let me understand that well, actually, they weren't receiving on the frequency that you were transmitting. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's sort of like I, I may have been two steps in front of them, where the other team, I might have been only one step in front of them. And they could, they could, they, you know, it was just slightly uncomfortable, but they could move there. Two steps was like a cliff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so we're really, I, I think, opening up more of the, the realm around yeah, I've been preaching it for a long time that the good people mm -hmm. of their own will create a process. They don't need to read about anything and, you know, in Scrum or, right, some, somebody would, you know, they were really good, focused on a vision, trying to get somewhere, we'll create a process. I always say that, you know, that, that good people will trump every other thing that you try to do. And they'll even create tools. Right. It's just, just now you have some places to start. If, if you want to, you know, begin with Scrum or begin with anything, any kind of, you know, Kanban or Agile, Lean, any of that stuff. But it, it, it all boils down to the leadership and the people and, and everything else is far secondary. So that's kind of what we've been doing. It's pretty fascinating to me because we're, you know, really helping teams and, and leadership engage and understand a little bit more about their culture and their social networks or organizational network analysis, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Are they siloed? Are they right. control oriented with their motivation? So, so it's, it's, to me, it's a, it, it looks like it could be the next wave of really trying to make an impact with the yeah. team by yeah. understanding a lot of the under, you know, where people are at today and help nudge them towards a, a place in, in the future. But yes. don't try to, you know, don't make them take two steps at once, you know, one step at a time. Right. So, I, you know, so I think that's that's pretty fascinating stuff to me. Yeah, it's very interesting, right? Because you're all pointing out the cultural uh, difference. And that's that's something I see right now also as a as a very big trend right now, org, org design, being adaptive, having a culture um, of agility across the entire organization. But then you do see, and this is, um, and I had worked with, uh, just as an example, with Spotify in the past, right? People are now looking at like, how do we map Spotify model to, to our organization? And it's again, it's the, hey, well, let's use a process from somebody else and we apply it to us, right? And then you get frustrated why it wouldn't work. And just to your point here, right? It's the, uh, the incremental approach is taking step by step and taking a culture from A to C, but you know, every culture or every organization is different, the setup and people and everything, right? So that's just a, the whole idea of it. So we're falling into the same traps uh, again, right? right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And the other thing that I kind of keeps me grounded is since probably 2005, I've worked on a, a program for firefighters. So it's kind of a pro bono, do good work to help save lives and, and property and things like that. So I write code every week. I do BDD and TDD and, mm -hmm. and deploy and, and that kind of thing. And, um, and it's extremely rewarding to get high NPS scores, to get really good feedback from our customers because it's, it's real, right? I mean, Agile, I, I experienced it myself, how, how real it is. Um, and being able to impact you know customers and get that kind of feedback that that keeps me oh, keeps my fingers on on you know on, and I, and I've recently led teams too through development so I'm I'm kind of a my yeah. favorite work is definitely building products and doing software because that's fun and tangible and right. engineering 
So. <laughs> exactly, right? And this is what the manifesto, there is the word software in it too, right? Uh, so there's a reason why that exists. And you pointed it out earlier. There are listeners now on this uh, podcast um, that might not have seen actually the, you know, the wrong way of doing it or the one that is uh, possibly causing uh, lots of difficulties and challenges out there, waterfall, for example, right? Now, what's interesting is that I think the manifesto came just at the right time and we, we, we had time to mature into something because what we're seeing now also is very different compared to 2001 is, is the fact that in 2001 was, you know, we supported businesses with technology. Now the business is technology, right? So a lot of uh, companies out there, when you say, like, what's your business? It's like, it is code, right? Uh, whereas before it was like, hey, let's get a product from out of the warehouse or something like that. And there was like IT solutions to support that, but it has drastically changed. Uh, not talking about uh, like planes and embedded systems and you name it. I mean, there's so much software everywhere and cars, you know. Um, how do you how do you see all that complexity uh, being handled? Like more from a technical perspective rather than the actual manifesto here, but what's your, what's your outlook? It's just, is this gonna, most likely it's gonna get even more so more complex, right? And so often is increasing. Yeah, and the um, the scary part, as as an aerospace engineer, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I would normally and regularly sarcastically say, if most buildings or aircraft or cars were built like our software or enterprise software, not a chance that right. I'm stepping in that building or walking over that bridge or, right, because I, I submit the software in industry. Well, I, I have two two folks on my shoulders that can fight it out about this because you, you can you can argue both both sides. But in general, the the industry I think is very young still as an engineering discipline. Mm -hmm. And some would argue it's not even an engineering discipline. Right? Some would say it's a lot of a lot of ad hoc, um, you know, not not such good practices. But uh, I, I'm, a, I'm assuming most folks applying software in what you might call critical, life critical, or safety critical systems are still falling back on classic designs for fail safe. Mm -hmm. you know, like, I'm pretty sure the elevator is going to still use a mechanical fail safe and not trust software. <clears throat> so, but it certainly is scary to think the more systems and we started to see some, you know, the 737 max and you right. started to see a, a few things that are all of a sudden popping out of, well, that's a pretty bad bug yeah, uh, you know, or, or bad testing or bad, whatever. Um, sir, we'll, you know, we'll learn from it. And it's not like, you know, everyone's probably seen that the bridge, the oscillating bridge and right. wherever it was in Portland or Oregon or somewhere or Seattle, <clears throat> um, you know, that, that was an engineering like, mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. It turned that into oscillating vortices. Right. That, you know, with the wind, who knew? Yeah, um, who knew? So yeah, it's not, not to say that everything will always be perfect, but it is a little scary to think of how, how software in the past 20 years right. really has become <clears throat> so dominant and it, you know i used to say about technical debt it can get so bad that you can go bankrupt and the more that you are a software company the more you better really care about being lean and agile and and have a architecture and you know together soft 20 years ago we rewrote the software probably every 18 months from scratch because we could and because we learned so much and we couldn't we didn't do a good job of maybe always refactoring it, but instead, screw it, just start over knowing what we know now, right. re-architect it, make it leaner and meaner, and then carry on, you know, right. keep both things going. Uh, you know, base camp, you can still get the old version. Like, there's a lot of different ways to think about solving right. the problem of business. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that the, the more innovative companies we'll grab onto it, do it right, because they'll understand, mm -hmm. you know, like talking to some, uh, a, a team, the development team about TDD and BDD and hearing a developer, 
but won't that slow me down? Well, no, I'm just my, you know, you're not born knowing, <laughs> you're not born with the knowledge, but, you know, things like, well, will the quality, will the QA people write, write these tests? Man. No, like the, the, the gap between um, under it, like understanding the holistic aspect of what we do to try to deliver outcomes and the interdependencies between, you know, for me, having tests is, is like a confidence booster, right? I, I feel more comfortable. I'm not saying they're perfect, right. but it's more comfortable. Did it take more time? Maybe the first time, but, but right. It's that it's like, how do you, how do you break that mentality right. that, that, no, we just have to constantly be grinding out code and we don't actually track all the debug later time. We don't actually track that we built the wrong thing. We don't act. So it's that kind of stuff is frustrating as hell. Yeah. Or, you know, the, our profession. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this, this goes to the point of, you know, uh, software getting more and more complex, you know, in, in the upcoming years. And it's just a trend and I think it's going to continue, right? To some extent that more software is being included, I think, into lawnmowers everywhere, right? So it's like, so <laughs> software is going to be everywhere and, uh, and it becomes more important to have uh, a good quality strategy around these things because we might have fatal accidents, we might have issues. So, so quality is a key thing and that is, that is deeply rooted in the uh, Agile Manifesto. So I think that is the, you know, we were lucky in 2001 that you guys did this and wrote this because it's going to be a guiding principle now for, for these organizations who are dealing with this complexity. I always uh, tell engineers when I work with them through uh, coaching and training, I always tell them like the, the line of code they're writing is it's not the expense of you writing that line of code. It's, it's maintaining that line of code. Um, right. So, and obviously refactoring or rewrites are necessary. Uh, because the cost of that long term, this thing has to be upgraded, maintained, and possibly there's a side effect of defects on that line of code. So, the, the writing the line of code, it's like minimal compared to um, compared to the following costs. Yeah, that's so true. I, I I would often say, you know, you know, when someone puts something cryptic, like it's not the one time you wrote it; it's like the thousand times someone's going to read this later. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the penalty. You right, that's yeah. Yeah. It could, and it could even be your future self, right? Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, it's it's trying to build that 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 professionalism, the craftsmanship, and the again the understanding of beyond the the the, the silo that you might think you're in, yeah. being a broader thinking individual, understanding we're trying to we're trying to build something long term, hopefully for mm -hmm. for a piece of software. And we're trying to make our customers happy, right. and um, yeah, there, there's there's good ways and bad ways to make that happen. Right. You know, I, I liken it to two different styles of gardens. If I, if I might do an analogy, my, mm -hmm. my my parents were big into square foot raised bed gardening. So people probably have seen raised beds, you know, so you don't trample on it and stamp down the, the and, and then you could work compost into it. And the square foot te technique was different plant, you know, you have different, you had boards with different holes on different centers. So different types of plants needed to be planted on for it. Anyway, he, he also planted things cooperatively, like something could grow underneath another thing that would be, be beneficial. So it was a, some, some of the most productive soil on the planet, probably. And then you could have a giant garden, somebody's different tactic, maybe full of weeds, not pretty to look at, not with nice wood chips in between. You could walk along, you could see his espaliered right. cherry trees and the asparagus, right? Might not be pretty, but it produces. It produces, yeah. Also. And the two CEOs running two, those two different farms, do you think they have a chance of comparing, you know, in, input versus output, any kind of process efficiency or, right? Our, our industry is so bereft of being able to understand effort versus output and and you could even say well i don't care i can get really cheap labor on that that big pile of land and yeah. i just plow it under every year and i don't weeds and all and it produces enough and i have cheap labor and i just rewrite it every every year right so i don't know the right i actually don't know the right answer yeah. because some industries it might be cheaper to throw it away and start over again yeah in other industries it might be worth 
to culture. You know, yeah. Curating it, mm -hmm. building a beautiful and manicured English garden or something, right? Mm -hmm. Who knows what the answer is? You know, we don't we don't all need to be, you know, gardens of Versailles, but we also don't all need to be, you know, weeds, you know, <laughs> a garden yeah. full of weeds yeah. that you can barely find the plants. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Is it that, that's what I think's a challenge in our industry. Yeah. I agree, and that's a that's a great metaphor. Uh, uh, thanks for that. Uh, just by the end of our podcast here and our time together, uh, is you you do travel a lot, and you travel to some remote places, uh, as far as I can tell, right? And uh, is there any kind of place you encounter where you still hear people? It's like uh, Angela Manifesto, what question mark? <laughs> so, or is this like, are you uh, not not talking about your celebrity status? I know we you. Uh, you know, you're, you're humble and everything, but are there still areas in this planet where you would encounter and people would not necessarily know that A, there is an Angel Manifesto you have traveled to and that you were part of that? I don't know, that's a good question. Uh, because I, I gave a, a talk with a, a group out of a few cities in China mm -hmm. and they were big into it. Um, I will say that you know, I think a couple of years ago, I was down in Columbia with with a friend of mine, Ryan Lockhart, who who uh, brilliant DevOps guy and beer maker, <laughs> friend of mine. <laughs> um, and I think it was their first we we keynoted their first, I believe, Scrum Day event, right? So um, Scrum Day Columbia or something like that. But I, I will say the. Columbia and I also spoke with, with a group in Mexico City and and in Agile Agile Greece. In in each of those cases, especially the ones I was in person, I was in person in Colombia and in person in in uh, Athens. It was it was like the early days of the manifesto. I mean, it was so heartwarming. Folks were so excited about the possibilities you know really i don't want to say it was like the first time that they were learning about it but it, it seemed like the community was was just beginning to blossom and right. they were, you know, i think agile greece is a little more mature but but certainly it, it struck me that that in in colombia just wonderfully optimistic and hopeful folks and and when people come up you know, want their pictures taken or thank you for the the, the agile right. man. I mean that that is so meaningful to me because, in some small way, what we did in Snowbird had such a positive impact on people's right. lives. That's, That's meaningful. Right. I mean, it's it's real, right? It's it's not it's 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 not fake, and you can feel it uh, in their gratitude. And it just it was lovely to see. That kind of enthusiasm again. Mm. So I, I, you know, that that's fun. Yeah. Oh, totally. I can, I can see, and especially in those early days, by the way, we were like, wow, we're already seeing the initial signs of this. There's more to it, and this is going to be uh, long lived. I mean, I can only speak, um, you know, for myself here. There's a lot of things in my life I got tired of very, very quickly. Right? Uh, not agile. Right? So there's something to this. This lifelong learning. Um, there is always something to be uncovered, discovered. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really fantastic. So, um, and, uh, Agile FM, my podcast wouldn't be called Agile FM without you guys. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, want to just thank you. Uh, we'll next time we'll talk about beer or we talk about other things on, on your list, but this was all about the Agile Manifesto's 20th anniversary. Thank you, John. Thank you, Joe, and I'd be happy to talk about any any other subject at any time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to Agile FM, the radio for the Agile community. I'm your host, Joe Krebs. If you're interested in more programming and additional podcasts, please go to www.agile.fm. Talk to you soon.